everyone thank you for joining um i, I want to start off by saying uh, by by thanking everyone on our team uh i my my team uh jaime lapidus uh allison repetti uh behind the scenes of course there was dorothy clay sims and and dr oregon hunter and and um we also had some interns and, and other people help out and they uh, were a tremendous asset to helping us try this monster of a case and when i say that i i i don't say it lightly but but the one person i really do want to thank the absolute most would be my wonderful lovely and and kick-ass co-counsel who uh for those of you in, in Columbus, don't realize how you have such an incredible gem of a trial lawyer who defines uh, everything that a trial lawyer should be. And I'm so honored and, and lucky to have had her by my side. And, and I can tell you, it, it wasn't always pretty. We bumped heads a lot, um, but, but uh, I, I love her more for it and, and I cannot, uh, thank you enough, Diane, for, for the amazing work you have done. And, and I, as everyone saw, um, it, it was a team effort, uh, but uh, Diane is, is certainly a, a shining star in that town. And, and Columbus, Ohio is very, very lucky to have her. Um, I also want to uh, reach out to uh, and thank our adversaries on the other side of the aisle. Uh, the prosecutors in this case, uh, they fought incredibly hard. Um, they're all very good people. Um, and, and I, and I will say this, um, we just see the world differently. Uh, and we saw things incredibly differently in this case. And, and I think numerous times things got really heated and, and, um, and, and for that reason, uh, I, I think you saw a lot of head uh, headbutting with both sides, but as it relates to William, uh, I can tell you he's incredibly happy, grateful. He wants this time right now to spend with his family. They're incredibly relieved uh, that this nightmare is finally over, and um, we are we couldn't be more happy for him and his family. A, a lovely really wonderful group of people. Uh, he is an incredible doctor. And, and um, it, it's, it's unfortunate that this happened to him. But we're glad for this verdict. I think this was the only verdict that, that justice uh, could have given. And I, I think that this is this, this verdict speaks to not only William, but all of those doctors and nurses out there who are attempting their best to give comfort care in a very difficult situation. And, and they don't need to be looking over their shoulders wondering if they're ever gonna get charged with a crime. And, and I hope this speaks volumes uh, to, to those folks that are decision makers and have the discretion to, to try and bring people into the criminal justice system. And, and uh, it, this was a scary trial for, for me and, and for all of us involved because we knew what was at stake and that was the future of comfort care and, and the future of many healthcare professionals who put their lives at risk for us daily. And, and over the last two years, if there's anything that we've seen, it, it, it's that. And um, they're truly heroes and they don't deserve a, a prosecutor telling them what they can and cannot do at bedside. And uh, especially with when they don't have any medical training whatsoever. I, I said this from the first day I took this case and from the first day I met the media on this case. And that was that this case doesn't belong in this courtroom. It, 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 at best, uh, it, it would have been a civil case, but the reality is um, William Husell was an innocent man always has been and always will be and and thank god for the for the jury and their verdict today and 
we could not be happier for William and his family and, and what message this actually sends to all of the healthcare professionals and prospective patients in the future. I, I certainly know that all of us will be there one day and, and I'm glad that if, if I ever uh, find myself in that situation that um, there's nothing like this restricting a doctor from providing comfort care. And um, we, throughout this process, it's been extremely difficult to bite our tongue. As, as you all know, prior to trial, uh, we speak, we're able to speak to the media. During the trial, while we had no gag order and we were free to speak to the media, uh, we chose not to because we we're focused on the task at hand. And uh, there were lots of times where we wanted to speak and, and, and voice our opinions of what was going on in the courtroom. But unfortunately, we couldn't uh, because that's just not the right way to try a case. Um, having said that, uh, I, I am deeply angered at some of the things that have been said about William in the past. And, and I hope that uh, people such as uh, uh, Chief Thomas Quinlan, who, who said that this was a breach of a doctor's oath and it was vile. I, f I find his breach of the oath of a law enforcement officer was vile based on the pathetic investigation that his department uh, actually had in this case. Um, and as it relates to the decisions made by, by the prosecution to, to charge William, I think it was a bad decision. And I think the once the new prosecutor took over, I think that just compounded a bad decision. And, and you can't allow uh, the spotlight to shine away your focus on being ministers of justice. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply saddened that William had to go through this. And, and you know, I, I could sit here and, and, and just be happy about it, but I, I'm concerned about those who, who are to come by allowing popular movements or, or just because there's a battle against fentanyl in the streets doesn't mean that we have to take it to the hospitals. And, and, and for that reason, I, I, I highly criticize uh, the decisions made in that, in that regard. But um, this, is, this is a moment, really one of relief as opposed to, to victory uh, because of the prospective dangers that, that this case could have brought to healthcare professionals and to future patients. And, for the, and, and based on that, if uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it to Diane if she has any comments. If not, uh, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, hi, this is Steve Brown from WOSU. Um, it, it sounds like Dr. Hussle will not be here today. Do you know when he would be speaking to the media next, if he will be? Well, you know, I, I immediately spoke to him after the verdict. And he just wanted some moment, some time to to be able to uh, spend with his family and, and and kind of let let himself decompress so he can gather himself together. And then uh, I will be discussing with him the time and place for for when he's finally willing and, and able to make a statement. Is he still indeed a licensed doctor? And does he plan have any? Uh, near-term or long-term plans to practice medicine again? He certainly does hope to one day practice medicine again. I can tell you that. Uh, and, and we on the team, I, I know we'll do everything we can. There are other lawyers that have been involved on the civil end of, of, of William's defense. And, um, and, and those lawyers uh, have worked diligently they helped us get through step one, which was this case. Uh, there are other cases pending, and, and certainly we plan on uh, addressing and attacking each and every one of those cases and, and hopefully getting great results with those as well, because I think the science is clear, and I think the, um, the evidence is clear that, that William Houston was a great doctor and, and hopefully can be again someday. I will tell you this, that, and that is that um, it, as it relates to William not being able to practice medicine, I think 
they lost a great doctor at a very critical time. Columbus lost a great doctor at a very critical time when this pandemic hit that could have saved more lives and been much more helpful. And it wasn't just William, it was all of the nurses and other uh, healthcare professionals that, that were fired from Mount Carmel just before the pandemic hit. And all of those people are, were hardworking, honest, honorable people who were just doing the best they could for their patients. And, and I, I think this prosecution harmed more lives than, than it, it could have ever helped. Uh, one other question, then I'll yield. The, the prosecution called 53 witnesses. You called just one. Was that because of your, of your extreme confidence in this case, or what, what was the strategy behind that? Well, there were numerous reasons behind that. Um, I, I can tell you um, one of them, and the main reason was just because you know they could have called 100, 100 witnesses. It wasn't going to change the facts. It wasn't going to change the evidence. And, and I, I, I think you all saw vigorous cross-examinations uh, uh, from the defense on each and every witness. And many of those witnesses were, were defense witnesses. And, and the prosecution had no choice but to call them because, uh, and, and I will say, if, if not, I would say about 90% of the witnesses called by the prosecution were, were all incredibly favorable to the defense and we would have considered calling them in our case in chief. But in this country, you don't have a burden of proof. And for that reason, you don't have to call any specific witnesses and no one should have to speak on in their defense in this case, in, in this country, because of, of the way our system is set up. And, and, and fortunately, it's, it's the best system known to man. And, and for that reason, we only called one witness. We didn't need to. We really didn't need to, and, um, and and for that reason, that should speak volumes to William Husell's innocence. Next question. I uh, yes, this is Maria Durant with uh, ABC Six WSYX. Uh, quick question: Have you had a chance to talk with the jury yet? Um, and do you see maybe one big thing that might have tipped things in your favor? Uh, we did. Uh, uh, Ms. Menashe spoke with the jury. Um, usually those conversations are kept between uh, the jury and, 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 uh, and, and the lawyer, unless uh, they specifically asked her to comment on their behalf uh, or, or if she's willing to disclose that, I'm sure she'll chime in. But generally speaking, those are things that um, that uh, are, are kept in, in private as, as all juries want to keep their anonymity uh, private and, and their privacy, it's paramount to them. I, I can tell you what I think the big turning point was, and that was the very first day, opening statements where, um, where we believe we laid out the case uh, and, and all of its complexities. Uh, the state put a red, uh, a 30 minute opening statement, which really didn't address the case or the issues. It was a, just a broad stroke out there of saying he's guilty of murder and this is the crime scene and, and didn't even address really the patients or the hospital or, or, or any of the witnesses that the jury would be hearing from. So I, I, I think the very, we set the tone from the very beginning. It, it was what we wanted to do. And the first witness, Detective Gillette, uh, everyone got to see exactly how this case was started and where it went, and um, which was extremely unimpressive. Next question. Mr. Baez, this is Bethany Bruner with the Columbus Dispatch. You said prior to this case in an interview that you believed it was a cause not just a case. And you spoke a little bit about that, but can you talk to us about why you took this case? I'm sure you get requests to take cases all around the country. Uh, what drew you to this particular case and coming to Ohio? Well, um, it's, it's crazy, but I've spent a significant amount of time this year in Ohio. Um, prior to this case, I was in Cleveland for three months trying a federal uh, medical uh, Medicaid fraud case 
and, and uh, Ohio has seemed to embrace me deeply. Um, <laughs> having said that, um, I, I will tell you this, um, and I took this case, it was really interesting the way it all came about. Uh, William called me very early on, uh, and unfortunately I, I was tied up. I only take a certain amount of cases, and I was tied up on other matters, uh, specifically uh, the Har Harvey Weinstein matter. And as soon as William saw that I was withdrawing from the Weinstein matter, um, uh, he immediately called me again and flew down to New York where I was trying another case. And, and we had a frank and honest conversation uh, with, with his wife, Mariah. And I, after looking at the evidence and what they were accusing him of, I, I saw the potential danger of, of a conviction in this case and, and what it would mean to, to healthcare and what it would mean to patients. There are a lot of people in pain all across the country and this war on pain that has been initiated by various governmental agencies needs to really step back and, and, and be cautious as to what they do. P people are trying to just ease their suffering. They're not trying to cause anyone harm. And, and doctors who have no motive, no reason to wanna to harm someone uh, shouldn't be looked at in a negative light because they decide to be aggressive with pain because sometimes pain can be incredibly aggressive to, to human beings. And, and that is why I took this case. I took this case because it meant a lot to me and, I, and I'll be frank with everyone. It affected me unlike any other case I've ever had. Uh, William was such an inspiration to all of us and the, his family was incredibly um, just, just a, a wonderful group of people who were very worried for William and the incredible amount of support that he had from the nurses uh, shouldn't be overlooked either. Uh, these are people who should have been angry at William for losing their jobs and, and, and in some cases careers, but instead they stood up for what was right. They, they stood up against the government which is not an easy thing to do. And they stood against the drumbeat for a conviction in this case, which, which was not an easy thing to do, but, but for their bravery, uh, we would not be here today with a not guilty verdict. And that's because they chose to speak the truth as opposed to fall in line with, 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 uh, with, with the witch hunt, which was basically what this case was. Next question. I've got a second question here. Um, you also filed an affidavit for disqualification for the judge in this case prior to the jury beginning deliberations. Can you speak as to why you filed that uh, and particularly why at that moment in the trial? Sure. Um, first of all, I, I will say it's, it's now unsealed. Um, and um, unless I get a, 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 uh, pulling me back text otherwise I, I will I will say I will say this much um, I have never tried a case that it was extremely hard to put on a defense and a lot of what was not seen in the background uh, were the struggles that we had putting forward our our case which was which included uh, all of the issues with po Project Lighthouse uh, our experts, our experts, as as well as um, uh, uh, the patient T.Y., which um, which was the benchmark. If you want to call this patient anything, you can call her patient zero, which really set the trend. And, and, and it was the experience that William Hussle had that changed and affected his dosing habits. And, and as you learn through the trial, that's how doctors learn. They didn't learn because William had this great training at Mount Carmel. You heard that he was hired fresh out of school and was placed there by himself in, uh, in the nighttime ICU. And, um, and, and basically all he had was his sound training and his experience to go on. And I will tell you this, uh, it was sound experience. 
Um, T.Y. suffered a very bad death, and we were prepared to introduce her and present her before the jury and all of the experiences that affected William and his dosing habits so that the jury could understand that. But um, the, the state was not having it. They had, they had no interest in the jury knowing the complete story. Um, when I, it was, they were selective as to what they wanted the jury to hear in terms of his statements. This is the first case I've ever seen where someone's confronted and the jury will never hear what exactly he said when being confronted uh, because they, they knew it was not beneficial to their case. None of the nurses were ever asked what he told the families. Uh, and, and one of the critical things that we thought was, uh, even though we were able to get it in a couple of, with a couple of witnesses, that he in fact advised them of the potential side effects uh, of these drugs so that they can make a full and informed decision based on all of that. I mean, I, I think these, this is critical information for juries to have when they have someone's lives, when they have someone's life in their hands. And how that can be justice is beyond me. I'm incredibly disappointed that, that this jury didn't have the complete picture, but we're, hopefully we, we showed them enough and, and so, so that we could, um, so that they could understand the facts a little bit better. Uh, as it relates to the timing, the, um, the, the motion to, um, the motion to recuse Judge Holbrook has now been, it, it was sealed until the verdict. And now that we have the verdict, it's unsealed so you can all read it. Uh, but basically there were a number of things that were going on and we had various issues with the court and we, were, we tried our best to resolve them. And whenever you're in, whenever you're in this trial and there is a, and, and you feel that you might not be getting a fair trial, this decision to, to move to recuse a judge is not one you can take lightly because one, you have to have a basis for it. Two, it has to be strong enough to, um, to be able to win. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is lose a motion like that because uh, in fear of any type of retribution. I'm not saying that Judge Holbrook would have done that or did do that, but um, the, it's a legitimate fear that a lawyer has when filing a motion like this. And when we, when we actually filed this motion, it was based on, it was based on, how shall I say this, um, evidence that we thought was overwhelming that and, and the standard is that the accused does not feel that he or she could get a fair trial. And uh, when you see the motion, you will see uh, what was actually uh, said on, on the record that, that made, that basically took us to the tipping point that this is not something that we could stand by and, and, and idly do. And if anyone knows uh, me or the way we try cases, uh, we fight hard for our clients, and if, if all, all we ask for is a fair shake in trial, and if we're not going to get that, we're going to certainly fight for that, and that's exactly what we did and why we did it at that time. Next question. Mr. Baez, I'm sorry if you addressed this. I, I hope you did, and I missed it. Um, the length of the jury deliberations became a story itself on Monday when uh, they, they told the judge they were at an impasse, and then he uh, read them the charge to continue deliberating. What were your thoughts when that happened? And, and looking back now at this point, does that seem like it worked out well for you because you ended up getting a, a full acquittal instead of a, you know potentially like a, like a mistrial like there was in another high-profile local, local murder trial recently? Well, Stephen, to be honest with you, we were we were surprised it was taking this long uh, because at the end of the day, uh, our understanding was they were deadlocked eleven to one on uh, thirteen of the of the counts and ten to two on the remaining count or the remaining uh, patient. 
we believed, of course, that those numbers were in our favor. So, um, and we believe that for several reasons, but the, 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 the very first and, and obvious reason should be that, the, that the, um, the prosecution did not present any evidence, zero, in terms of, of William Hussle's motive or, or intent, I should say. I know they don't have to prove motive, but they didn't prove intent. They didn't put on any evidence of his intent. I, th I think they tried their best to, to, to bring a witness in to talk about odd numbers and microwaves and, and bromances. And that was the best that they could do. And that was, uh, and I think that was, if you were in the courtroom, it was laughed at. And, um, and I, I certainly hope that no one ever has to stand trial for murder based on such flimsy evidence in the future. But, you know, as it relates to the jury deliberations becoming a story, we were concerned uh, because of course anything can happen, but we fully expected this to be a quick, quick uh, verdict for that reason. Um, if you read the instructions and the elements, it's clear they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt intent. And when you don't offer any evidence of it, uh, it, it it's, it's ridiculous. Um, they attempted through their experts to, it, to talk about his intent, but a, a doctor from Florida is not gonna be able to tell you what a doctor, what's in a doctor's head in Ohio two years later. Uh, it, it's just absurd. And the fact that he uh, included uh, information that didn't, th that, that wasn't relevant to intent, didn't make it any better. So, um, and, and of course they had biggest, uh, big problems with causation too. So um, I hope I answered the question there. Next question. I must say, I've never heard such a quiet group of, of reporters in my life. Um, Jose, this is Bennett Haverly with WBNS in uh, Columbus. I had asked Diane the similar question I'll ask you. Was there something singular that you thought tipped the balance in your favor, or was it a number of things? If I, if I were to say singular, I would say... Um, I would say it was an innocent man. And if it were multiple, um, just look at my closing argument. I, I could have gone on for days, to be honest with you. And I could have gone on for days during my opening statement, just showing one piece of evidence after another, after another. The hardest part about trying this case was the records were so voluminous because these were such sick people that whenever the state tried to introduce evidence that, that we thought would have been somewhat misleading uh, or, or uh, that made William look as if he was doing something wrong when he really wasn't, we had to go at, at the moment and find something in the records that, find what was in the records that completely contradicted that. And we did that multiple times to the best of our ability but trying a case, uh, defending a case is a very hard thing to do because it's not a scripted event and, and you have to be able to respond and respond quickly. And, and, uh, and that's why I, I thank my team at the beginning of this, pro at the beginning of this presser because it, it's not a one person victory. It's not a two person victory. This was a team effort with names and, and faces that, that you've never heard of and, and, and um, never saw. But there were a lot of people working hard just to try and stand up to the government. And, and that's an incredible, hard and scary thing to do just because a prosecutor and a, and a police chief get out there and hold a press conference and say, this doctor is a, a serial killer um, or, or, uh, you know, or, or something like that doesn't make, it doesn't make it so. And, and, and um, it's unfortunate we live, we live in a society that, 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 uh, that, that finds uh, interest in punishment, uh, but justice does not mean to punish, justice means fairness. And, and, and we tried our best and it wasn't always easy because of the obstacles we faced, but, but um, there were multiple, multiple reasons. And, and I'll tell you this, um, 
but it, uh, and, and I'm not singling you out or your or your series on this case, but um, it, it's a good example of if you have um, media agencies, PR agencies, professionals, crisis management folks, you know, beating the drum for for a couple of years, that is a hard thing to defend in the courtroom. Um, and, and it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, but um, but fortunately we have, we, they still have to answer to the truth. And the truth was William Hussle was an innocent man and, and he was wrongly charged. And, and, and thank goodness that justice prevailed. Many times it, it was an incredibly difficult uh, and, and challenging uh, case to present. Yeah, the only follow-up I would have would just be I asked Diane the same thing. And you guys still feel like this is a case that belongs in civil court, not in criminal court, correct? At best, it's civil court. On its best day in civil court. Um, you know, when you don't have a policy and you don't have guidelines, how are you going to say someone's wrong? You want to leave it up to a doctor's discretion based on the clinical picture of the patient. You have to allow this doctor to utilize their training and experience to treat these patients. What are you doing taking medicine out of the hands of a doctor at bedside and handing it to a prosecutor in the courtroom? I think it's foolish and, and, and it's outrageous. And, and for that reason, I, I don't have a hesitation to speak strongly about it and point the finger at those who screwed up in this matter and, and, and put these patients' families through uh, through a second round of, of mourning and, and, and this whole process. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, I feel, I feel terrible for all of the patient's families to having had suffered again, but uh, hopefully they'll take solace in knowing that their loved one's last moments were, were ones in peace and, 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 and that they didn't have to suffer bad deaths as a result of, of a doctor being afraid to make them comfortable. Next question. Jose, Dan Perlman with NBC4. I apologize if this question has been asked already. I was in the hallway uh, talking with Diane and just stepped back a couple of minutes ago. At what point throughout this trial, if there was a point, did you believe that this might turn in Dr. Her Dr. Houston's favor? Was there a single moment where there are several throughout the last nine weeks or so where you started to uh, believe not, not guilty would be read on all 14 counts? Well, I, I don't know. Well, I, I can tell you this, uh, Dan, you, you've covered the case um, throughout the pretrial process. And I don't think you ever saw us shake or, or in, in fear at a, a, of, the, of the evidence in this case or, or what we believed was going to be presented. In fact, I think you heard me say, and, and I think you could see in the courtroom, we were anxious for William's day in court. And, and it, if there was ever a turning point, I can't say there was. It was the day I took the case that I knew that this was an, this was an innocent man. And as I read through the, the evidence, Every day while reading and the months and months of preparation that went into trying this case, um, the years of preparation, I should say, um, we knew that, that there was never a fact that we knew there were facts that, that might have on the surface looked bad, but we also knew that there were other factors and things that could explain it. And for that reason, um, we, we always felt confident, never overconfident and never underestimating our, our adversaries who, who put up an incredible fight. And, and it, was a, it was a difficult thing to do based on the nature of the case. Remember, not, not everyone wants to hear these, not, not everyone wants to talk about these topics. That was, that was a challenge. Uh, the, the overwhelming presumption of guilt in the community was a, a major challenge. Um, the knowing that the patient's families felt the way they did based on the calls and conversations they had prior to being questioned was a challenge. Uh, and, and 
you know, we, we knew those things were going to be before us, but the reality is the truth. We, we were hopeful and confident that, that the truth was going to prevail. And, and, and that would be, I, I wish I could give you guys a turning point, but it, it really wasn't. There were some moments in the courtroom that were incredibly impactful. And, and I think uh, my, my co-counsel's cross-examination of, of the state's so-called experts uh, was, was uh, devastating to the state's case. I think um, the questioning of the lead detective in this case set the tone for the trial that, that, that this was a, a, a farce of an investigation to begin with. And then I also think that, uh, that there were, as the administrators of the hospitals were questioned, that you got to see some of the uh, rationale and, and, the, and the process of how this case unfolded and I think, and I think all of that spoke volumes. Having said all of that, we always knew and we were aware of some of these things. Um, I, but I, I, I cannot tell you how scary it is and should be for everyone to know that if a doctor can get charged like this, anyone can. And, and we have to really do our best to try and just wait for a person to have their day in court. Next question. Everyone has what they need and they're ready to go back and write their stories, huh? <laughs> All right, well, uh, I'll see. Diane, do you have anything you'd wanna add? What a moment. And I, I said this when I was walking into this uh, press conference, what a moment for William and as you said, Jose, for patient care, right? And for our, our country with respect to healthcare. And um, it's just, you know, and I hope William starts to begin the rest of his life. Every minute that passes today, I, I, I wish that for him and I'm just so happy for him. And, and I can't emphasize enough what you also said, Jose, this was an incredible team effort, Jaime and Allison and, uh, obviously you and me and um, and Dorothy and everyone behind the scenes, you know who you are, um, even though you're not named. And um, it was it was a incredible team to be a part of. And um, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know she doesn't mean that, everyone, but I, I know it comes from a place of love. And, and I and I said this to <laughs> for for those of you who don't know, um, the, for for the non-trial lawyers out there, um, when you try a case with someone like this, you either uh, don't speak to them ever again, or or you become family forever. And and uh, just so you all know, I know Diane would echo it that we're we're family forever, and and we just. Uh, we, you know, you grow to to really love someone based on. Uh, 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 facing adversity uh, like we did together. And, and I, I cannot tell you how lucky, incredibly lucky I am and the Columbus community is to have uh, uh, a rock star trial lawyer like Diane Manashi. And I learned so much from her. And, and um, I'm, I'm very lucky to have gotten this case uh, and, and I, I want to thank William and, and Mariah Husel for entrusting their lives to us and, and, and giving us their trust. And, and it, it meant the world to all of us and we never took it lightly. So um, thank you everyone. And, and um, if, if we don't have any further questions, um, I'm more than happy to end this thing <laughs> and to finally loosen my tie. <laughs> Anyone else going once, twice? All right. Thank you all for for attending and and um, and I, and please. I hope you report this the way it should be done, and, and that is a victory for healthcare uh, and for future patients of comfort care, and 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 a fine, amazing doctor, Doctor William Husel. Thank you.